know several of you have been to the Thought Leadership Series before. Anybody remember Diane Burton? This is going to test my one. <laughs> just <makes> it <laughs> So I think it was nine or ten years ago, Diane Burton came to town, um, and we were fascinated. Was she at MIT? Then? I believe she was. She at MIT. Turns out that our speaker today, uh, Diane, was a sponsor for her master's degree work, uh, thesis work. So the world comes around maybe over a decade or so. Um, I first heard Melissa speak at future offices in New York City three years ago and was fascinated with what she had to say, largely because she looked at the world and the group she works with, Class Art, look at the world differently than the world is looking at work today, I think. Uh, everybody's focused on data. The more data we get, the better off we are. Well, I think if, if they look at it uh, with data, big data and little data, but they also look at it with the lens of the humans that occupy the space through actually talking to them and actually watching them work and uncovering the magic behind all of those things. So I think when you get those three, like, three or four lenses together, you get a good picture of what the workplace probably ought to look like. And that's why we wanted her to be here today. So, I do just want to say thank you uh, to Hickson and to our fabulous uh, host here at Seed Strategy. Um, really neat uh, both to be uh, invited to do this, um, especially after uh, my mentor was here uh, 10 or so years ago, um, and also in a beautiful new building, which I think was um, designed and built with many of the founding principles that are part of this uh, conversation today. Uh, I do have a couple break points to turn into conversation, but please do uh, raise your hand or just interrupt. Um, I'm happy to uh, flesh out this topic, converse uh, about it further. So, so stop when it gets uh, stop me uh, if it gets to a point where you think would be good for conversation or, or to ask a question. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, when when Brian called me to talk about this presentation. Um, his, his point was kind of, you know, we've, we've sort of become obsessed with data, right? Um, and I think that in many ways, the availability of data and quantitative information, information at scale, um, you might hear big data, voluminous, uh, high velocity uh, data um, is, uh, is pretty sexy. Um, and it's, it's particularly compelling for architects um, who maybe feel like we've been data poor for quite some time. Um, not from a building or structural perspective, but from a what is the occupant experience perspective. Um, I've always been jealous of website designers because they could keep moving that shopping basket button around as many times as they wanted to until they got it in just the right spot that more people would click on it. But we don't have that benefit. As architects, we pretty much get to build it once. Um, we can prototype in a couple of different ways, but we can't uh, have quite as much uh, of that built model uh, as, uh, as you could in a digital world. But that's changing really, really quickly. Um, and we have more and more data sources for architectural work than ever before. Um, and that's really what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna tell you a little bit um, about what is workplace anthropology and what, is, uh, what are some of the tools that we use to bring a social research perspective to our work. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about data and the uh, sort of explosion or uh, significant emergence of data uh, resources and availability and even give you a chance to, uh, to look at some of those options and apps on your phone. Um, and then show you a little bit, a uh, couple case studies about where we've put the two together because I think that's the real aha moment um, which I'll go through in this presentation. So um, I'm Melissa Marsh, I lead, her, I lead an organization called Plastark, uh, and we are uh, really focused on making the world a better place, uh, one workplace at a time. We define workplace as the places where people work, um, and, uh, but that could be where coders code, nurses nurse, teachers teach. Um, it could also be places where people uh, work in a more traditional or lab labor capacity. But what's interesting to us is that when people are paid to be in an environment and paid to do a certain task or activity there, that there, there becomes an economic equation about that environment. Um, as you might say in marketing, there are no neutral messages. The same is true in architecture. There's no neutral condition. Everything about our environment is either helping or hindering what we're trying to do there, from uh, live and play concepts and our wellness, 
um, to the functional or cognitive tasks uh, of our work. There's, there's not an instance that the, that the architecture isn't playing a role there. So our work is to get to the heart of what are the things that are impacting the human performance in this space and how can we do more of the things that create positive impact and the architecture is enabling and less of the things that might be the architecture, the interior design, even the way the space is managed is slowing people down. And, and that's really the, the basis of our work and being able to build an economic model for that is um, to some extent how we get paid uh, for doing that work, the, the basis of which is, is spatial and organizational improvement. I often say that what our team does is knitting uh, big data and little data together. Um, we think of big data as the information that might come through building systems, through security systems, or interaction with mobile devices. Uh, and little data is the, convert, is the conversations, the stories, uh, the things that we might see uh, glimpses of uh, in an anthropological or ar uh, architectural research engagement. We do this work uh, at the scale of interior design, architecture, and urban uh, landscape. So really not thinking about the scale component of it. Uh, you might imagine it as a corollary to architecture or the built wor world as human interface design, uh, much like the folks who are studying that from a computational perspective. Um, we're at a particularly exciting moment in time um, where we uh, as an industry, uh, really used to measure buildings by what I call the, call the, qual the um, geometric and financial metrics, right? So we uh, cost, square footage, square footage per person, um, really the basic uh, foundations of measurement. Um, and increasingly, we can be just as quantitative about the things that you see on the right that formerly would have been described as soft. Um, and so a lot of our work could be described as making these soft factors uh, more hard uh, through a, uh, a rigorous and, and science-like uh, process. So for example, um, just one of those serendipitous interactions. So uh, serendipitous interactions used to be thought of as something that you could not model or predict. Um, you could maybe watch and observe it uh, once a space was built. Uh, but now we can take a architectural or a CAD model, we can take estimates of what the different functionalities are in that space, the different population within that space, and we can run a model which moves little bits and pieces through uh, that uh, architectural environment before it's built and actually predicts what is the frequency of interaction within that space in the future. And we got to that point because we've been able to collect information and understand uh, what's going on. And, and we're really just at the beginning of that, right? So um, your, your mobile phone carrier knows where you are at any point in time, whether they choose to disclose that to you or to the federal government or anyone else, uh, but the, the data and the information are there. Um, so, that, so if we're leveraging that better as, as an architectural and design resource, we can use it um, hopefully for good purposes rather than for uh, nefarious purposes. Um, but to make the buildings work better for people. And that's just one example. All of these things are increasingly measurable and therefore modelable. Um, I also uh, like to just uh, mention sort of a, a foundational uh, principle. You may be familiar with Vitruvius, uh, either through the Lego movie or if you studied uh, architecture uh, in your career. Uh, he said that well building has three principles firmness, commodity, and delight. He was speaking long before well uh, meant uh, healthier well buildings, but really to say that buildings that are, are good for people. Um, and uh, that firmness component uh, in the first world, we are lucky enough to uh, have uh, confidence that our buildings are gonna stand up. Um, that's not true uh, all around the world, but we can say here in the States, we have gotten that one figured out. Um, and great engineering provides us constant comfort that the buildings will stand up. Um, the next is utility or fitness for purpose. And I think that uh, we spent most of the 20th century figuring out how to, how to make buildings function from a technical perspective that the use matches. Um, there may be some good points and bad points in that. You might think of historic buildings that are more multi-purpose, more changeful over time. Uh, more contemporary buildings uh, or, or late 20th century buildings 
um, that were sort of single purpose. We have hospitals versus offices versus schools. And I think we're almost going into the next era of more flexible buildings, longer term investment in those spaces and changeability over time. But certainly we can measure the utility of a building, uh, whether it be from a financial perspective or from a functional performance perspective. So I like to say that we're in a golden era of architecture and design, having figured out number one and number two, we can now focus on delight. Um, and we can focus on buildings that achieve uh, an elevated quality of human experience. And through these new digital uh, threads, uh, so to speak, um, and combining the, the uh, big data with the little data, we can actually measure delight. We can find ways that we can see people's perspective uh, of the uh, environment uh, and use that to make more spaces that better suit uh, people's preferences. Um, any questions so far? All right, just getting warmed up. Good. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is the way that we combine that, that big and little data. Um, and I think of it kind of like how the tectonic plates coming together um, brings us mountains. Because I really do think that we're at that moment in time where we, we see something um, emerging that hasn't been visible before. Um, architects have long practiced a variety of different ways of getting to know our customers, um, from shadowing to um, uh, embedding ourselves within the uh, organization's uh, standard uh, interview practices. Uh, some architects and interior designers and city planners working in a more socially integrated way, some working in a less socially integrated way. We have entire volumes of architectural history on the wrong things that we did from an architecture and urban planning perspective, but certainly the best bringing this together. We had um, a level of applicability to multiple locations before. It used to be that you studied a client and you knew what was going on for that client, but it wasn't done in an academic or um, statistical kind of way that would allow you to apply it to other locations or individuals. And I think that's a lot of what big data and the wellness movement have, have brought to us that we can kind of see what things are client specific or client unique and what things are um, driven more by human factors uh, and the characteristics of individual humans. And then in the world of work, we've got everything in between, right? Like job function, role, responsibility. What are the things that you're doing that are unique to that role, not specific to you as a person, um, but more specific than the kind of human factors? Um, so the first thing I wanted to look at uh, here in, in looking at these tectonic plates uh, coming together from the, uh, the social observations to the big data um, is the anthropological side. So I, I often get, get asked, you know, kind of what, what does that mean? Um, basically, workplace anthropology means taking the tools and skill set and capabilities and approaches that might be part of an anthropological perspective might be uh, used to study uh, culture or historic sites um, or uh, in some instances uh, organizational behavior and applying that lens to the workplace. And so just some examples of what we might see uh, in that, uh, sorry this uh, image is a little bit gray, but we get often asked about the, uh, adjustable height desks, that sit to stand desk. And I've often heard from clients, well we're not gonna do sit to stand desks uh, because we've piloted it and not everyone uses it. Or we're going to do sit to stand desks, but we're going to do only 20% and then 80%. We're going to figure out who gets the 20%. Or you need a doctor's note to get a sit to stand desk and we're going to swap them out. So there's a lot of supply and demand, uh, you know, observable challenges here that um, you can, you're probably going to spend more money running the system of deciding who gets what than you would if you just got 100% sit to stand desk to begin with. So, but put that logic aside and go with the one that says we're not gonna do it because we've tried it and not everyone uses it. So this is an example of a client who did 100% sit to stand desks and new behaviors emerged as a result of everyone having something as opposed to only a few having something. So when only a few had sit to stand, they were a weirdo if they used it. And so there's a social barrier to actually using the resource that you have, 
When you remove that social barrier and you uh, allow everyone to use it, of course you get increased usership to begin with, but then you get totally new behaviors that you probably wouldn't have figured out before that. So this right here um, is actually a, uh, a kind of um, a study zone with a chair and using the pedestal as a footstool. So someone has raised their desk all the way up and they have uh, created a little cubby underneath that is their reading booth. Um, that isn't something that would have been considered a typical behavior if you only had your 20% allocation of this uh, setting. Uh, the other example is that uh, groups, when they have a conference call, because there might not be a meeting room that they can all go into, they all put their desks at the top level in standing position. Most of the other uh, folks have their uh, desks down low. They put on a headset and they have a conference, a video, video and audio conference together, but they can see across the office to the other people that they're on the phone with. So they, be, they invent a space that was never there before by virtue of that choice to stand up and be on the phone together. Um, so two behaviors that maybe wouldn't have been expected are evidence of the value of the investment in the, um, in the sit to stand desk over and above what could have been observable from an economic perspective that we wouldn't have seen or we wouldn't have proof for at what was going on and document it to change the decision making that was there previously. Um, another example of uh, approach and, and to, um, to make another point, which I think a, a key to that anthropological uh, effect uh, is that of documentation. So uh, often when we're operating just in a traditional or architectural design world, uh, we might be taking notes for ourselves. We might be taking notes for our design team. We might not be taking notes uh, in a more methodical way that allows them both to be shareable uh, with our team, with our clients, and also uh, the rest of the world as well. So I think another feature of that anthropological approach um, is in the uh, rigorous documentation uh, and finding new and interesting ways to report on what we see. Um, just another example of that anthropological approach might be um, in, in how we develop adjacency diagrams, talking to uh, folks and asking who they're interacting with, who they'd like to be interacting with in the future, maybe shadowing different groups um, and seeing how they move through a space. Um, I'm hoping that you're beginning to imagine digitized ways of doing this, right? That you might um, have the uh, location or proximity sensor turned on on your phone. You might opt in to be in a virtual focus group where you share and report your data. And then we can go and generate this kind of uh, information or diagramming uh, about the current behaviors uh, in a digitally enabled way, allowing us, it's, it's almost like the equivalent of if you were able to conduct a two or three day workplace study um, with 100 people instead of two people on the research team, not on the observed group. So that's the kind of scale um, that that digital uh, gives us. It also allows us to move from a, sh a snapshot, right? So you might be able to spend two or three days with your client and capture a certain amount of data. But then if you're able to extend that to a big data set to pair it with, that could be the equivalent of observing for two or three months, or even two or three years. So um, it takes that same basis of how we would approach something and it expands literally the data points that are, um, that are visible or apparent. Just another example, we're moving from that, um, that low volume data of the anthropological approach to higher volume data of a, of a data driven approach. Any questions on workplace anthropology? Do people have a working definition of that? If we had CEU credits here, could you check that one off? <laughs> yep, question at the back. I'm just wondering if you Sorry, have, could you say your name? Oh, hi, I'm Kate Rexteiner with Empower. When you're doing that type of research, do you have um, the end user folks who get nervous about privacy and 
oh, they're, you know, Big Brother is watching me. What are they doing with this data and how do you address it? Yeah, so I'm going to um, end the conversation talking about focus groups and piloting and opt-in and all of the good best practices for making people feel positively engaged. Um, but in the meantime, I would say transparent communications is job one. Um, we uh, send out an email that says what we're doing and why we are doing it. Um, we include a headshot of the person who's going to be doing it so that you can get to know them um, and feel that they're part uh, of the team. Um, I think it's important that there's a good relationship between a employer organization and the employee organization. If that trust is broken, um, then you're walking into a, a, a a complicated situation. I wasn't quite going to say toxic, but um, yeah, you could really make a non-trust situation worse. So um, I think baseline is that we uh, we're working with clients where uh, the best can be assumed, and that is expected. Um, if we're working a client and we've learned that that is not the case within their organization, we might go about some other approaches or try to do some some coaching early on. Um, and then I think it's in either trust or you don't, I think both transparency of communications um, and commitment to change, right? You don't want to ask any questions that you're not planning to address. We can tell really quickly with an organization, um, their survey response rates, whether they have historically responded to people's opinions or not, right? So we see uh, generational differences, younger people are more inclined to fill out the survey because that's more part of the culture. You can't watch a movie or spend a night at a hotel without getting a survey. Um, older people are less, uh, less frequently exposed to that. So we generally get higher um, response rates from younger folks. Um, but you can see within the context of an organization, a variation of like 20 to 30% response rate in an organization that's collected people's opinions and done nothing about it. And 85 to 100 percent response rate in an organization where there's active engagement and you're getting feedback and using that survey mechanism to improve people's performance. So um, yeah, does that answer the question mostly? Okay. Um, and then always who you've studied. Um, so, uh, there's th and that's kind of like a whole conversation. There's something called the data selfie where you can capture uh, what your data looks like in the marketplace using Facebook and LinkedIn and things like that. Um, but really that people feel ownership and that you are responsible for using the data that you're collecting um, on them. Okay, so super exciting uh, moment in time. Buildings are getting smarter and smarter. Um, and what I mean by that is that they're really getting uh, filled with more and more uh, sensors, data collection devices, uh, more likely to have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, and maybe really two categories of, of smart buildings. One is the aspects of the building that are technologically enabled that are allowing that building to work better for us and to be more dynamic. This is sort of the next generation of, uh, of sustainability and wellness-based buildings. So if you've got uh, sensors uh, in your lights, whether those are daylight sensors or occupancy sensors, uh, it used to just turn off and on, and now it leaves a, a digital trail that might allow you to see what the utilization of that space is over time. Another example might be uh, that we've had traditional uh, building uh, entry. Uh, you maybe check in at the front desk. You maybe fill out a paper-based login form. Uh, now a person entering a building with a QR code that they're putting up against a turnstile or they might otherwise check into the building either through a social uh, media platform or through a building system and security. So um, the, the, the smart building, as we call it, is both um, from a building uh, technology perspective and the engineering and equipment that's in the building, and then it's also from the different ways that the building systems are able to respond and interact with the individuals within that building. Um, so really what's going on here, if you're uh, familiar with a guy named uh, Stuart Brand, he wrote a book called How Buildings Learn about coming up on two decades ago. Um, and uh, he put forward uh, this, uh, this idea of site, which is uh, forever after, structure, which is 30 to 300 years, skin gets changed every 20 years, that's the outside of the building. 
seven to 15 years. Um, space plan might be three to 30 years, hoping it's more like three than 30 years. Um, and that stuff was the things that we moved around uh, within the building day to day. So you could first say that all of these things are becoming more changeful. People are probably updating their space plans more, more quickly. Uh, lease timelines have changed. So we've moved from 15 and 20 and 25 year leases um, to you know, a WeWork or a co-working is a day to day lease. Um, but most uh, organizers say, uh, most uh, real estate folks will confess, though not to everyone, um, that leases are moving from 10 or 15 years to three to five years. Um, but now we have a person who is digitally enabled with their mobile device to move those things around, to turn the lights on and off, to adjust the heating and cooling, uh, to uh, submit a facilities management ticket to say that they want a room set up in a classroom environment or uh, a dining or charrette environment like we're in right now. So, and the thing that's making this really different is what you might call the trace data or the leftover information in the system which comes from operating those things uh, digitally rather than manually. Some examples that might be part of your day-to-day -day life. Uh, Google bought Fitbit most recently announced 2.1 billion. Yeah? Um, you'll have to think about that. Um, but uh, the, the, the point here, both there's a lot of things that are becoming part of our day-to-day -day life, but also that there's, a, um, there's an absorption of those things to a smaller number of total providers. Um, so a startup uh, that might be an initial data source that's independent is then becoming part of an integrated uh, platform uh, in the future, so uh, could be could be a good thing, could be a, a bad thing. How uh, um, another way of looking at it uh, would be all of the different uh, ways that you're managing your day-to-day -day experience, right? Um, you're maybe using Lyft or Uber for car rides. Uh, you're maybe using uh, Netflix or Hulu um, to watch movies and, and videos. Uh, you're probably using uh, LinkedIn or Facebook to connect with people. Um, all of these are the different ways in which you're um, managing your, your life, and increasingly it's what you expect your building experience to be managed in. So if you uh, are asked to rate a movie and then new movies are proposed to you, you might enjoy watching this one, then why wouldn't that be the same for a conference room, right? After you had booked uh, conference room B on the third floor of a building, uh, why wouldn't, when the next time that uh, you try to book that room, uh, you get a notification, sorry, this room isn't available, but because you like it so much, we know that you'll enjoy conference room four, uh, or conference room A on level floor four, right? So to kind of start to take that building information and people's preferences to guide them towards spatial and uh, placemaking decisions that's gonna better serve them. They don't have to try every conference room uh, to have served up to them uh, something that they're going to enjoy better. So my point here is the few things that we can see from the um, digital world uh, of our own lives uh, to these features of the building uh, is really only just begun. It's, it's only the be beginning. If you imagine that there are, um, does anyone know how many sensors uh, are in a phone? Two, 10, 50, 200? Very good guess. There are between 20 and 30 sensors in your phone, a whole variety of things, from accelerometers, uh, which allows you to, when you flip it up like this, turn on the screen. There's, two, there's at least two light meters. Uh, one is facing towards you in order to adjust the brightness of the screen when you're looking at it, and one uh, is in the other side of it uh, on, uh, on a camera. Uh, so. Uh, it's, it's filled with lots of different sensors that generally allow it to support you and to perform better. Imagine that there's 20 to 30 sensors in that uh, device that's in the back of your pocket. Imagine when we get to a true building, uh, building technology, information, information of things platform, 
how many uh, sensors there could be uh, in a typical building, right? So, and I think the real uh, opportunity is when we bring the two together, we're using all of what's in, in your back pocket and we're connecting it to uh, that, that building that now has a very different uh, learning infrastructure. You might uh, compare it to the relationship between hardware and software uh, in, compu in computers emerging 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I think also an important component of this is really emphasizing the intersection between be able to be collected about you um, or collected on you uh, as you go through your day-to-day -day experiences, but also the significant benefit uh, or focus on what's called self-quantification. Um, self-quantification um, is really the idea of uh, collecting information about yourself in order to improve your performance in almost anything. Um, to some extent, it could be seen as originating uh, in folks like those with maybe diabetes who have to, uh, for medical reasons, quantify aspects of their uh, life, whether it be a food and beverage uh, intake or exercise uh, intake, um, but also that we are now uh, all armed or enabled with a, a wide variety of self-quantification devices, whether that be kind of the typically known uh, of Fitbit uh, or of uh, Nike once had a fuel ban and it's now part of the Apple Watch. Um, but these are all, this is just a tiny sampling of the different kinds of uh, approaches to self-quantification, which allows you to track your experiences and then correlate them to how you feel about things. So I imagine a future in which a person might come to a manager at their desk and say, you know, I could really be working 20% more effectively if I had a different daylighting uh, rather than artificial lighting system. Uh, and really the, they're, the, the same way we see people who are able to optimize their nutrition, optimize their, um, their uh, athletic routine uh, and see the impact and performance of that moving from what we consider basic physical characteristics to more of our cognitive characteristics uh, as well. So um, really just to connect back uh, between the uh, people component and the sort of anthropological component and the data component, what we're doing is using data and technology and information in order to scale or expand what is at the core an anthropological approach, right? That we're really looking to understand how people are using their space, how they're experiencing it, how they're changing it, how they're interacting with one another, et cetera. And then we're just using that big data to uh, put more of a wrapper reinforcement uh, around that. Um, another example here, uh, Comfy. Uh, recently, interestingly enough, bought by Siemens, which is a building <coughs> technology and infrastructure organization. This started as an app that would allow people to vote on the temperature in their space. I'm hot, I'm cold. Um, it now has a, uh, a sensor location system in it, as well as being tied to uh, the building uh, HVAC or, or temperature system, so that it can now say, oh, you're hot or cold? Well, we could adjust the temperature or you might consider moving to the south side of the building where it's a little bit warmer, or you might consider moving to this location where it's a little bit cooler. So it can give you real-time information and benefit from the fact that people are more flexible and mobile within their environment to increase the likelihood that the person within the work environment is satisfied and comfortable. Um, they're also now uh, integrating with room booking systems, and I think the future will be that you're able to book a room and that when you get to that room, it is set up in the style that you would like it to be from a multi-sensory perspective, right? It's the lighting that you want. Um, it's the uh, acoustic configuration that you want. Uh, much of that is digital. You might even be able to plan ahead for the scent that you want in that room, whether you want it to smell like coffee uh, in the morning to help energize people, or if you want more of a uh, herbal citrusy uh, smell in the afternoon to uh, refresh and awaken people. But really the idea that it's, uh, it's every aspect of that environmental experience that's uh, able to be changeful. Um, and then that's what you see, uh, the, whether it's from um, co-working or from space management platforms, 
uh, we're really able to see over time uh, what seats are available, what seats are being utilized. I don't know if you have much experience with, uh, with a space booking app. Uh, you might consider it the comparator to um, booking your seat on an airplane. Uh, you can go online, you can check in, you can pick which seat you want, you can maybe change your seat. Uh, in the early days, I don't remember upcharges for different seats. Do you guys? It was all like, uh, it was all one price, right? But now they're gaming that system. They've figured out what the most desirable seats are. And now it's like $30 extra for an aisle or a window and you get the middle if you don't want to pay extra, right? But what has that done? It's put an economic value on certain aspects of the experience that we may not have been able to <coughs> quantify otherwise. So now you literally ha would have a business plan that would allow you to sit down with an airline carrier <coughs> and show them what the economic impact of having a configuration that only had window and aisle seats. And we didn't have that data before. We couldn't, as designers, sit down and say, this is going to be the return on investment for a different environmental condition. And so here, we're starting to have that same kind of data. We can see that a group of people choose to sit at a certain, um, a certain set of desks within the work environment why even have the other desks that don't ever get occupied, right? Let's use them for something else and make sure that all the desk settings are of, an, of a certain environmental quality. Um, so in summary here, uh, we really do, uh, the, the perspective is that uh, the combination of this human factors viewpoint and the data behind it allows us to have a different kind of workplace experience than we've ever seen before. Um, and that from a people perspective, what we might call this is a consumerization of workplace and ability to see what are the preferred features and characteristics uh, and the expectation for high performance, customized, on-demand and technology integrated uh, experiences to move from lifestyle to the workplace. Yes. Quick question. Um, to your earlier Spaces that nobody sits in. It seems to be that conversation is moving toward a more open address or free address in the workplace. Is that do you see a lot of your clients, or are there a lot of clients that are moving to that? Or yeah. That? So you could touch on that. So kind of having been in the world of workplace quantification for the last twenty or so years, from where we were like going. There was a, a, an IBM mobile app that allowed us to you know, count that by hand uh, even before I got uh, into the business. Um, I think the first generation of um, workplace utilization data um, was used to reduce the size of workplace. Um, and um, even at that time, I said that um, underutilization of space is a marker of the under design and under quality of that space. Not, we're not using it, we can throw it out, we don't need it. Um, but, but nonetheless, whether it was driven by um, recession or organizational efficiency or corporate mindset, that the result of seeing unutilized or underutilized space was just to get rid of it and not to redesign it. Um, and, uh, you know, there certainly is. I think there's certainly an opportunity to use buildings better and to use buildings more intensely, um, but we then need to design the buildings differently in order to do so, right? We need, we need different infrastructure, uh, more ventilation, more restrooms, you know, all, all different features in a, um, it's almost like an urban environment versus a suburban environment, right? In that urban environment, it's built for desired density versus the suburban environment where it's lighter density, but also substantially lighter infrastructure. Um, so I think, uh, to get to your point, um, the first era of, um, of workplace utilization went to have less space. And then the second era, I think, has been more recently more mindful of using that information differently to improve the space with the proposition that if we have the space, it should be desirable enough that it could be used. And if it's not being used, the first step is to ask how it could be designed differently. Um, and then the second is, do we not, do we not need it? 
Um, and I would say that uh, to the question about uh, unassigned desks or um, activity-based working in the work environment, um, I think that could maybe even be seen as sort of a third generation of if we, um, if we take away the assignment of individuals to particular work settings and we sort of let them uh, sort of free, free range working, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what is it that we would see uh, come of that? And so um, I think broadly that uh, workplaces need to have a lot more diversity of space. They need to not be just desks and offices and meeting rooms, but to have a real wide diversity so that there's something for everyone. Um, and then that people are given choice about whether they sit consistently in a single location versus have, have uh, the flexibility to move around within those spaces. Um, only if you're not careful, going back to that example of the sit to stand desks, you may have an environment where you've built diversity, but you haven't given people social permission to use it because there still could be a mindset that you need to be at your desk, your desk to be working. Um, and you may have provided a physical environment that enables something that hasn't been enabled socially. Um, and I think a little bit that, that um, sort of, it's almost like tweendom <laughs> that we're in. We're in this like gawky, awkward phase of figuring out the, the social difference between the former model of assigned desks and assigned offices and the future model, which is that people have autonomy and control. Um, and just as in, I'm sure, many of your other presentations, certainly Diane Burton's uh, presentation, would have been about what happens when different systems of an organization are changing at different rates or speed. Um, and the, the way Diane Burton looks at it um, is that you've kind of got structural components, you've got cultural components, you've got the tools and systems that you're, you're working in, you've got the industry that your organization is in, and if those things move it, evolve at different rates, you become asynchronous or, or kind of out of balance as an organization. And I would say that workplace and real estate tends to be the slowest changer of any of those, and so often is the drag on an organization rather than the accelerator of an organization. But no neutral messages, it has the power to be either one. Does that mostly answer your question? Okay, awesome. So um, we wanna get you out of here at uh, 9.30, uh, which just gives us 10 more minutes. So I'm gonna do a couple uh, more topics and then uh, zoom through to the finish line. Uh, I just wanted to conclude that section about uh, the anthropological approach and the data approach um, to reinforce that from our perspective, uh, smart buildings are social buildings. Um, and so uh, when we're thinking about that smart building, if we're thinking about it only as the lighting sensors and the HVAC sensors and all of those things that are making the building smarter, and we're not talking about the components that's the human interface, and then learning from that human interface, we're not really yet talking about a smart building. Um, and it doesn't have to be all custom built. If you're in, uh, if you're in a client role, if you're in a specifier role, um, I highly recommend that you look at off-the-shelf options for better enabling your workplace um, before you go and do a, a home built or spend a, a lot of money on a custom built uh, solution of this example. Um, and I can give Hicks in my deck uh, afterwards, uh, but I do, nope, I'm not calling you out because you actually remember the ones that you take pictures of better than all the rest. Um, but if you uh, are feeling like you want to take a picture of every single page, then we can get it to you afterwards. Thank you. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, uh, okay, so go in. Um, one of, I think that one of the best combinations of the anthropological approach and the data-driven approach is deliverable through piloting. Um, I think historically in, in office interiors, we've maybe had furniture mock-ups, um, which allow people to, uh, you know, s the, the worst of it is it's a beauty contest and you're just looking at three uh, types of furniture. Uh, the best of it is that you actually create an experimental environment that allows you to test certain ideas and get people's uh, feedback on it. Um, I was delighted to see all of the work that is being done uh, at Hickson, where they have all of, they've taken the places that used to be 
um, storage or filing or piles of paper and construction documents from buildings that you can't even remember. Um, and now they are all of these different furniture settings um, and there's a voting terminal at each one to ask people uh, what they liked about or didn't like about that uh, environment. So um, I'm sure the next generation of that is going to be an app and we can do it in our mobile device, uh, but certainly uh, the right approach in terms of uh, taking that example environment and asking people what they like about it. Um, and to your point, the, um, the, the proof is in the pudding if there's change after that feedback, right? So if you make that pilot and then you don't change anything, um, then you really haven't done what you should be doing for your people uh, and taken advantage of that pilot environment. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to another app. We talked about um, those fitness uh, apps and the different opportunities for self-quantification. There's a very cool app called uh, Physics Toolbox. Um, it, look, it works a little bit better on Android than it does on an Apple device, but basically it allows you to turn on all of the sensors in your phone um, and to record a variety of different things. Uh, from decibel levels um, to lighting levels, you can walk around within your uh, environment and see what the different uh, lighting levels are. Um, I recommend that you use it um, more for seeing highs and lows. Uh, it takes a little bit of extra work to actually calibrate it so that it could be used as a scientific device. Um, but it does allow you to say, hey, I'm, ac I'm acoustically uncomfortable in this environment. Hey, quick check, what's the decibel level? So it really gives you an opportunity to fit your personal experience, your personal sensory experience with a more uh, scientific or shared uh, quantitative metric. Um, and then I uh, did want to uh, finish up that activity that some of you had started uh, when we first uh, got in here, um, and that is to reinforce, again, the power of this kind of socially networked or socially connected uh, environment um, by asking you to uh, go to LinkedIn uh, to open um, the second button in on the left, um, which is the uh, connect with others or the social network button, uh, and then to turn your location uh, sensor on, which allows you then to be, uh, have visibility to the people who are proximate to you. Um, I think this is a basic feature uh, of mobile technology, um, is that it does have that proximity uh, sensibility. There's a bunch of different ways that that can be deployed. Um, but what it means is that now uh, you have the ability to uh, connect uh, with others here in this environment. Um, you should be able to see them. We all have to have it on. So that's another measure of sort of the trust network. It's not that people who aren't part of this community um, can come together. But again, I hope that uh, using tools like the LinkedIn um, proximity feature or like physics toolbox or maybe comparing to your Fitbit data will allow you to think about what is possible for all of the data uses um, in that environment. Um, we actually, uh, I just spoke with someone um, of ANFA, Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture, um, and they are, uh, we're working on an opportunity uh, to, at the next AIA convention, to have a data donation station um, where people can share their information from some of their self-quantification, some of their experiences, and share their data with others. So um, really the idea here is that connecting people data and building data uh, will bring us to a more elevated uh, place from a, a better buildings perspective. Uh, but in order to get there uh, and also protect the privacy um, and respect individuals, uh, we need to have a different approach to how we're collecting that information and data. Um, so I've got some case studies here which I'm not going to look at, but I can publish and share with you. I do want to stop on uh, one piece here, which is we do a fair amount of our research in co-working environments. Um, we, uh, we're often, I think, I sometimes say we're spies that are spying on co-working and bringing those practices and principles into uh, traditional corporate environments. One of the reasons why we like to do research in co-working environments is because people have more discretion and choice. There are fewer social boundaries and fewer expectations of where people should be in order to be doing their job. 
Um, and this also connects to your question on activity-based uh, workplace and flexible work environments. Um, so what we've done is we've uh, created an index of environmental performance from a individual human perspective, and we've coded every place on a, uh, a seat map for those uh, performance features. So it includes daylight, uh, view of the outside, uh, interpersonal visibility, so can you see uh, other people, uh, secure vis security from a, um, uh, so this is the equivalent of prospect, that we want to have um, our back to something secure and we want to have visibility uh, over others. So this is making sure that some, uh, in a seat that someone's back isn't facing sort of primary circulation or another socially uncomfortable uh, physical position. Availability plants, bookability, technology capacity, temperature and transparency of the space. And this is showing is that it are spaces that perform high in that feature more likely to be occupied or unoccupied? So what we see um, is that places that have visibility uh, of plants uh, vary from uh, 49 to 20 percent utilization so that we see that's the level of impact of plants. This is the level of impact of transparency a view at, of outside, these are, the longest bar is the most impactful, meaning that having that feature will increase the likelihood of that place being occupied. Um, that this security factor, um, temperature, and technology are the lowest in terms of that feature appearing to compel people to use the space. So now we're not just able to see what are the features of an environment that are going to draw people to that environment, but how is that actually weighted so that we're spending our resources on the things that are going to be most valuable to, to individuals? How is transparency just um, defined on that? Defined? Graph? It's yeah. um, the number, so we're looking at the four sides of an environment and to wh what are the materials of the four sides gotcha. of that environment. Is it open? Is it glass on three sides? Is it gypsum wallboard on one okay. side, et cetera? Um, so I will also share uh, offline the Plastar approach to this, which is really bringing these uh, data points and qualitative points together. <coughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about what our future strategy is. So. This is how we do things now. We have a staff survey, interviews, plan analysis, occupancy data analysis, and we bring it all back to people in a workshop. And this is how we imagine doing it in the future, that we're building up data feeds that come from a variety of different other um, organizational and systems improvement platforms. Um, everything from, uh, you might be familiar with uh, surveys for uh, your cultural environment, uh, Culture IQ, Culture AMP, Glint, these are surveys that your organization might take and then get uh, basically helpfulness uh, scores uh, on how well you're operating from a cultural perspective. Uh, we might have data from uh, various rebooking systems, uh, people's calendars, building systems. Uh, and so instead of pulling all of these things together manually as we have done in the past, we'll be able to feed these different off-the-shelf data sources into a model of how well your organization is performing and to what extent that is being influenced positively or negatively by your physical environment. And so just a few uh, takeaways. I hope that um, going forward you have the perspective of moving from space management to people enablement. Um, thank you again very much for our, to our hosts. Um, I was mentioning that uh, architects sometimes think of the delivery of the building as the end of the project. Uh, it is actually the beginning of the project if we think about the life of the building. Um, and you go through so much change to get into a new building, I advise that you keep that change going um, and aim to keep your building alive by the way you manage it over time. Um, without the right problem, you can't find the best solution. Um, and a couple big data uh, takeaways. Um, the things that you don't want uh, are analysis, um, maybe when big data goes bad, it's sometimes referred to as uh, a breach of, um, a, a breach of uh, privacy uh, or information being shared that you don't want. Um, I think that when 
uh, big data goes bad in our world, there's some different characteristics. Um, broadly, that we get stuck analyzing the data and don't know what to do with it. We make tone-deaf decisions looking at only the data and not the small data, not the uh, people story, not the impact of making changes. Um, that we might interpret the data without context or nuance, not understanding uh, the people or the social context. That we might be biased in the analysis or the application uh, of that data. That we might address only the symptoms rather than the causes. Back to utilization, right? Getting rid of the desk because it wasn't being used rather than saying this needs to be a different space type or this needs to be a better desk. Um, and then I think the biggest one is collecting but not using. When we collect data uh, but then we don't act on it or we spend a lot of uh, investment to get information uh, but we don't do something uh, interesting and valuable with it. Um, and I'll just mention again that as we have more data, we need better and better hypothesis. Um, otherwise, we're in a boiling the ocean situation, right? So we, um, just to underline the starting point um, and, uh, and acknowledge uh, Brian uh, and Hickson is that if we don't have those people-based insights, if we don't have those design hunches and all of the things that have been part of great architecture and design to begin with, if we don't have that as the starting point, we're really not smart enough to be taking advantage of that big data. So it really is those two pieces coming together, not that we're going from traditional architecture to data-driven, but it's two pieces coming together uh, and reinforcing one another. So thank you very much.